Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the webinar on Must Know Hazard Tips by Louis Whiting. Uh, we are delighted to have participants from every part of the world. Uh, my name is Samir, and I'm the founder and CEO of Notified. We are delighted to present you our newest offering in Academy that gives you premium access to exclusive content, including webinars such as this. Uh, for those who are new to Notified, we are an exclusive platform for business professionals. Here, a subject matter expert can earn for their content, a solution provider company can promote their solutions to their target audience, and a business professional can seek solutions and expertise to stay relevant in their roles. What makes us unique is that our machine learning engine scans through thousands of our business professionals and identifies those seeking solutions, matches them with those having solutions, notifies and connects them in real time. What exists today requires you to search. With Notified, a new era begins where you don't have to search, instead you will get notified. I would like to thank you for the overwhelming response and wish you all a happy learning. And for our viewers watching us live on YouTube, we apologize that we could not accommodate all those who missed out due to limitations on Zoom. We promise to host you soon in upcoming webinars. I will now pass the mic to my colleague and moderator for this webinar, Farooq Khalifa, uh, the co-founder and vice president, product management. Over to you, Farooq. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us for this uh, excellent and uh, waited uh, for some now this uh, Hazab uh, uh, webinar. Uh, from the beginning, I would like to share with you some ground rules about how we're going to run this webinar. Uh, the webinar is scheduled for 20 minutes, 25 minutes from uh, presentation from Luis. Uh, also, we're going to have everybody muted during this time. Uh, where we will uh, wait for your question, regardless uh, if you have a question, you can uh, post your question there in the bottom of the banner or the uh, bottom of the Zoom. You have a place where you can post your question so you can take it from there. Uh, also, once we the presentation finish, uh, we're gonna open the mics for everybody to speak. Just raise your hand, I will, uh, we will give you the, the mic. Right now, I would like really to welcome Luis. Luis, she's a, a process safety engineer providing process safety service to wide variety of industry uh, through high quality workshop facilitation, particularly focused in technical workshops such as Hazar, Bluba, Haz ID. Uh, she is adaptive to completing a new workshop such as energy optimization and other key brainstorming session. She has a deep uh, technical expertise developing through extensive experience within operating company in both process and process safety rules, upstream, onshore, offshore in oil and gas, uh, facility from drilling, completion to export, pipeline and oil and gas processing. Please uh, welcome we with me, uh, Luis. Uh, Luis, uh, you have the mic, you can share your desktop, uh, maybe when I will go for the, the bull in the beginning. Thank you, Farouk, for that warm welcome. Yes, Samir, if you can share the... Um share the poll. We're just going to start with a bit of interaction today. So if you guys can answer the uh, questions, we'll share the results of the poll. The first one is, have you ever attended a HAZOP? Samir, just let me know when we had enough voting uh, yeah. and share the seconds. results. Uh, the results are still coming in. So 10 more seconds and then I'll uh, launch the poll. So can we go for the results, Samir? Okay, that's good. That's great news. So we have a yeah, mixture so of experience and uh, new people to Hazop. And Samir, the next question is? Okay, do you manage organization of Hazop session or the closeout Hazop session? So I know some of you who maybe have not attended HAZOPS might actually be managing some of the closeout or closing out HAZOP actions yourself um, just because of the situation you find yourself in. So All 
right, so I am going to launch the results now. So about the same. So that's really good. So today in the webinar, I'm going to be covering a little bit about the basics of HAZOP and then also a little bit about some tips for HAZOP Action Closure. I just wanted to kind of get the level in the room to know what um, you guys know about HAZOP so I can make sure that I speak in the right way. So um, as I said, we're going to go through some of the key things about HAZOP. Uh, document preparation, facilitator selection, team selection, recording, report writing, and action closure. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's coming next after some time for questions. So what is a HAZOP? I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. There will be a follow-on session where we go into detail about the different parts of HAZOP, how you conduct a HAZOP, who participates. But it's a structured meeting to assess the process hazards associated with a particular facility, process, change, or operation, right? And it's all about the process. So a HAZOP is applied to a process. Um, and when you have the procedure, that is applying to a process, a startup of a process. So it's very structured. It's a very specific hazard identification technique. Um, if you apply HAZOP to the wrong scenario, you can get results, but it may not be the right results or may not be as comprehensive as you would like. If you apply it to the right situation, you can get a pretty good picture of what the hazards are associated with your process and where you may have gaps. It's normally followed by a layers of protection analysis or a safety integrity level assessment. So we can provide more details on those later if you want, but this is, the first set step is the HAZOP, where you identify your hazards. And then this is followed by sort of the layer of protection and cell assessment, where you're actually specifying how you're going to manage those hazards in more detail. It's always a multidisciplinary team. In general, there's an external facilitator, but I'll go through this in more detail. A HAZOP cannot be done by one person. Often this is attempted to save time. Some one of the team members will pre-populate, but that is not really an effective way to do a HAZOP and it won't give you the best results. So um, preparation is the number one key to a successful HAZOP. If you don't prepare before you start your HAZOP, you have the chance that you're not going to achieve the results you want. So some top tips for preparation, write a terms of reference. Now, this doesn't have to be 30 pages long. It just needs to say, this is the system we're going to analyze. These are the drawings we're going to look at. These are the people who are going to attend, what time the meeting will be. And this is the methodology we will be following. Once you've prepared one terms of reference, the other ones are relatively simple to prepare thereafter. But it makes sure that the team know what you're going to be looking at in that session. We need to select a HAZOP facilitator in advance. Now, I know that a lot of our situations when we prepare for a HAZOP or to identify our hazards associated with our process, perhaps we haven't had a lot of time for preparation. But if we have a good facilitator selected in advance, then that will allow us to get the preparation done before the HAZOP and allow more smooth flowing of the meeting. There are some standard checklists uh, on documents prior to the HAZOP. So, when we're HAZOPing, in general, we are HAZOPing PNIDs or process and instrument drawings. There are some standard checklists which are based on industry standards, which can be completed on your PNIDs before you start. This will significantly reduce the number of issues identified during the HAZOP and the number of actions or recommendations. For example, if you have a relief valve, which is downstream of a blockage, that'll be one of your checks to do in your checklist. Um, and then you could move the relief valve so there's no blockage between the relief and the source. Uh, that immediately removes one action from your um, HAZOP. Also, there are other things associated with rating of piping, etc. So if you can have those standard checklists, if you don't have them, get your engineers to develop them um, so that are based on the industry standards so that you can just check that the design meets the industry standards before you go into the HAZOP. Provide documents in advance to the facilitator. Now you can do a HAZOP and I've done many when I haven't seen any documents before the session. And that's fine if your facilitator is very experienced and has a really good process knowledge. Not only 
um, and can adapt to a new process which they may not have seen. But if your facilitator is a little bit less experienced, you maybe you have a difficult team, maybe there are some members of your team who are very strong. If the facilitator hasn't seen the documents in advance, it can cause problems during the session. And have the documents printed or available on another screen for online workshops. So what I found in the workshops is if I'm trying to talk about a drawing and I'm talking about Valve X and people don't have a printed version of the drawings, they're trying to, they're either trusting that I know what I'm talking about, which is not the way to run a HAZOP, we should all be looking together, or they're trying to look over my shoulder to see which Valve I'm talking about, or I'm having to swap the screen display. So having a separate printed copy for each participant or having it available, for example, on an iPad that people can have a look at or on their laptop was really helpful to make the workshop flow a bit better. Right, the second one is facilitator selection. Now next to, um, next to uh, preparation, facilitator selection is really important. They can make or break your session and they are responsible for what, recording what happens in your workshop. You could have a really good workshop and then if your facilitator is not very diligent at recording, the output from your HAZOP can be almost useless to you to going forward. So what to specify and how to select somebody. It's obviously ideal if you can have someone who's been referred to you, because that generally means that people knew who they were, they liked the way they run the session, they felt comfortable with that person, Those, that person maybe has a good process knowledge. If it's not possible, go with someone with experience facilitating this type of workshop, okay? If someone doesn't have experience facilitating a HAZOP, but maybe has experience facilitating a HAZID, that doesn't mean they're going to be good at HAZOP. So it would be good to get that person to act as the scribe or the person who records during the first session to shadow somebody else who's more experienced. Someone who complements the skills in your team. So what do I mean here? Well, if your process engineer is somebody who has say less than five years experience in the industry, I would be looking to make sure my facilitator was a process engineer with more than five years experience in the industry so that your team is strengthened in an area where you have identified a gap. If your process is very mechanical, for example, if you were doing a BOP HAZOP, um, a blowout preventer HAZOP, that's a quite a mechanical um, system. If you have somebody very strong mechanically in the team, then any facilitator is fine. If you don't, having somebody who's mechanically minded and understands what a BOP is used for and the wells associated, that would complement your team knowledge. You want someone who listens. Um, it's really tempted to think that a good leader is somebody that can uh, talk really loud and be really confident, but actually a facilitator's main job is to listen. What we record on the worksheets is a team consensus. And if your facilitator just has already in mind what the HAZOP should be, um, the output should be, and doesn't listen to anybody in the team, it's almost a wasted exercise and you're wasting everybody's time. So you need somebody who listens. And then someone who has recognized skills in this area. Now, how do you know if they have skills in this area if perhaps you don't have skills? Well, you can look at what they've done before. Have they done HAZOPs before, as we said? Do they provide training on HAZOPs? If they are qualified to train others on HAZOPs, that probably means they have quite a lot of skills in this area. You could trial them for a small scope before you assign them for a much larger scope is another way of identifying whether they have the skills in this area. Team selection, right? So we have the facilitator now, but we need the rest of the team in the workshop. The team collabor collectively decides what is discussed, what actions are recorded and how the workshop flows. The right team can rescue your workshop. So if you've failed in your preparation or your facilitator is not very strong, if you have the right team together, you can still get to a good, really good result. You need someone with operational knowledge of the facility. So I don't need operational knowledge of a milk processing plant when I am busy looking at a nuclear reactor. I need someone with operational knowledge of that facility. How are things actually done here? So for example, what happens on night shift how do we follow procedures at this facility? How is the lockout tagout work here? 
that is the type of person we need in the workshop who understands how things are done at that facility. If you're building a new facility, it will preferably be someone who will be forming part of the operations team when the system starts up. We need someone with detailed knowledge of the process being reviewed. Now, if you're designing something, this is the process engineer and normally the quite senior process engineer in charge of the project. If you're operating, it's hopefully the senior process engineer from the facility, the person who knows how all the different things interact, who knows if we get more flow here, this is going to happen. If we add this chemical by accident, this is going to happen. We need someone who knows the consequences if something goes wrong. So that doesn't have to be a separate person to the other two we've already identified, but it can sometimes be someone called a loss prevention engineer, which is typically what my role was. You need to know, so if I have a hydrocarbon gas release in this area, am I gonna kill one person or 50 people? Is there a potential that this toxic gas cloud can go across and go into a um, occupied area off site, or is it so small it's going to be contained within the site? So really understanding what the consequences are is important to getting the right result in your HAZOP. If you underestimate the consequences, you won't provide sufficient safeguards. And then when you start to operate, you will be in a place where you don't want to be, you are underprotected. If you over uh, specify the consequences, then you're going to have too many safeguards. And if you build a facility like that, it's going to put an enormous maintenance burden on your um, operations. And that is an enormous cost. So you need someone who really understands the actual consequences in this situation, and they can articulate that clearly and you can record that in your session. We need someone who, with knowledge of how the system performs in upset conditions. So I've put here, this is typically the instrument engineer, but it depends on how complicated the system is. If it's a small system, the process engineer may be able to uh, interpret the cause and effects for us. But if it's a large project, we definitely need the instrument engineer there who has knowledge of the cause and effects and who can help us in this area. And then we need someone who's independent of the organization. I know that there are times when there are significant financial, political, other pressures on a specific team delivering a project, right? You want your HAZOP to be free of those pressures so that you can actually identify the hazards and put the right controls in place. So you need somebody independent of the organization. Some companies bring in an independent process engineer. So this is somebody from outside of your project team. So not within your project team, not subject to the same pressures, or it can be the facilitator themselves. They could be the independent person. And they just ask the question, go, really, guys, you guys want to do this? So that is the person that you need to be independent. Sometimes it's not possible to get the independent facilitator. And that's why you might bring in an independent process engineer into your session. Let's move on to recording. When the workshop is done and the work really begins, if the workshop is poorly recorded, recommendations can be closed incorrectly, or the in worst case, the hazards could be left unmitigated, right? So you have all the best will in the world, you have really great discussions in the session, and you don't record it well. That could mean that you've just wasted three, four, five days, maybe even weeks. So what to record and how to record and who should record? Right, the recording software, so a lot of people recommend that you use a recording software like PHA Pro or um, HAZOP recording software. But if the scribe or the person who is recording or the facilitator doesn't know how to use it, it can really impact the flow of your meeting. Right, so make sure whatever software you use, even if there is Word or Excel, just make sure that software is familiar to the scribe the scribe knows what to put in each box and they can navigate that during the session without taking everybody else's attention off of identifying the hazards into correcting the scribe. This, you click on that box, click on, oh, don't forget to double click. That's not what you want in the meeting. The scribe's ability to record, right? So everybody has different typing skills and different listening and typing skills simultaneously. It's quite a tricky thing to do if you haven't done it before. And it can also be very tricky if English 
if English is the way that you are recording, if English is not your first language. So make sure you allow sufficient time. So if the person is not familiar with the software or is not familiar with being a scribe, you may need a little bit more time on the first day or in the first few hours so that the scribe can get used to writing whilst listening and summarizing. Decide on full recording or recording by exception. Now, industry standards strongly recommend fully recording, full recording, which means that you record everything you discuss, even if you don't identify a hazard. For example, if we say level high, but we're not doing anything with level in it, we would record not applicable. Yeah, so we've, we've looked at it, we've identified it's not applicable, we're not going to record anything. But there is also a different way of recording, which is, called, which is called recording by exception. So we only record something if we talk about it. So I'll ask you about level, you'll say, no, there's nothing, I'll go, okay, what about temperature? Oh, no, there's nothing, and we just carry on. That's fine, but if there's an accident, when we go back to the HAZOP report, people won't be able to identify whether you just missed it, maybe you didn't even talk about level because you forgot, or whether you spoke about it and you didn't identify the hazard. And then make it clear to the facilitator and the scribe what is expected of the output. So if you want full recording, you want to make sure that you record um, asset, environmental, people, consequences, tell them what you want, but tell them before you start the session so they can make sure that it's consistently recorded and you get what you want out of the session. Next is report writing. So once we've done all the recording in the workshop, that's great, but normally it's summarized in a report. Worksheets can be a great way of seeing what actually happened in the meeting, but it, it can be a little bit more difficult to action the worksheets. So what should our report look like? It should contain an executive summary. And as a minimum, the summary should say what date the meeting was held on, how many uh, recommendations were raised, um, whether all the disciplines were there, and then whether there was anything specific which could have impacted the quality of your HAZOP. Now, I've mentioned before, there can be very strong participants in your meeting, and sometimes the only way to move on is to record what they're saying, even if the whole team doesn't agree. And these are the sorts of things that you need to be putting in a summary. What has impacted the potential quality of your HAZOP? You need some actions or recommendations. They need to be listed in a separate table. And your worksheets and drawings should be added as an appendix. It is really, really, really important that your report contains both the worksheets recorded from the session and the drawings used in the session. I've seen so many HAZOP reports where the file has become corrupted and we cannot open the worksheets or we don't know which drawings were used, which version. They were marked up with red pen. We don't know what they look like. Make sure they're both in included in the report. The report should be ready within two weeks of the workshop for a small to medium sized workshop and recommendations should be able to be provided in draft the day after the workshop. Now, if you have a workshop which spans several months, don't expect the report to be ready within two weeks, but you should be able to get a recommendation summary on a daily or weekly basis, depending on what you agree with your facilitator so that you can keep track of how things are going. Action closure. Right, so we do all this great work in the HAZOP, we know where our gaps are, and actually action closure is seen as one of the major contributing causes to majority of incidents which are listed on the CSB videos. We know what the problem was, right? In Texas City, we knew there was a problem with routing the gas from the knockout drum to atmosphere. There was actions to move that, but they didn't close them. So a great HAZOP and the report do not mean that you reduce the risk. Just because you know what the risk is, you know what you should do about it. If you don't do it, you're not actually reducing the risk in your facility. The recommendations or actions raised in the workshop need to be closed efficiently and effectively to actually reap the benefits of your workshop. You've invested a great deal of time and money into this exercise. Make sure that you actually get the benefit of it. Make sure resources are available to close the recommendations. This is probably the most common reason why recommendations are not closed. Prioritize recommendations to follow, to allow for a targeted closeout. So as I mentioned before, if you, get, if you 
do those pre-checklists before you start your hazard, you can eliminate a large number of uh, recommendations. If you haven't done them, a lot of those recommendations you raise may actually just be, uh, you know, just drawing amendments. And those can be categories a little bit lower and they can be closed out in bulk, for example, when you update that drawing. Others require a bit more engineering, a bit of thinking on how to do it. And maybe they're really urgent because before we can update the drawings, we need to know what we need to decide on this topic. So prioritizing recommendations to allow for targeted closeout is important. Having someone independent assuring the intended outcome is achieved in the closure. So sometimes when we close an action, we don't actually achieve the intended outcome, i.e., you know, I want to make sure this hose is maintained at a regular interval. My action says, put the hose on the maintenance register. The closure says, this type of hose is not normally put on the register. Action closed. No, it's not closed. I want the hose to be maintained. That is the intended outcome. And so therefore that action closure would be rejected. And we make sure that they somehow make sure that that hose will be maintained. Have a management focus on overdue actions. Don't just let overdue actions build up and build up and build up. If you're in senior management or managing your facility, ask people about overdue actions from HAZOP or your risk studies. Say, so how many are overdue? Where are we with them? Ask them so that they feel like that is important to you and they should focus on closing them. And then have clear stage gate requirements. So if you're in a project phase or if you're doing a management of change and you needed to do a HAZOP, then have clear stage gate. We can't proceed to execute until we have all of the recommendations of priority one and two closed. Right? We just can't do it. We cannot go forward. And then engineers know what well, that is really important. We cannot go forward. And they put a real focus on closing those recommendations. So that's all I have uh, today for the presentation. I'm going to open the floor now for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, great uh, simple presentation, I think, to the point um, where a lot of people we have, uh, they are already in business of HAZAP. Some of them, they are already just maybe uh, interacting with the HAZAP process. Uh, technically, we are opening the floor for the question. Uh, I'll take a few questions which is written, then we will open the floor for the people who can raise their hand and uh, take the mic. I think one question came early about um, the hazard process of the Greenfield project uh, when people doesn't have um, that much experience, operation experience. What kind of experience you would like to find in case of Greenfield project that people, they have not much operational experience with this some sort of facility. So how are you gonna build a, a hazard study on something you are not Maybe familiar with if I understand the question right. Yeah, so when you do these sort of greenfield has ops, you normally do them in several stages. We normally have something called a course has op, or some people can call it an inherently safer design review. And that is really looking at the design and saying, is there any way that we can eliminate, minimize, mitigate, or control our hazards? If we can eliminate them at this early stage while we still have loads of room to play in the design, that's what we should do. We then move over to the next HAZOP, which is normally our detailed design HAZOP. And this is where we're gonna get loads of actions because we, this is kind of our, our first real look at the PNIDs with all of our team. Now, you're not going to have somebody designing your facility who has no process experience. They may not have process experience in that topic, but they will have some experience. Likewise, you will be able to find somebody with some operational experience, perhaps not in that specific element if it's a novel technology, but they will have some operational experience. The alternative okay. is to hire a facilitator with strong operational experience. Uh, that's another option. Okay. Uh, there is other question, then I will open the floor for people if they want to raise their hand for uh, the mic. Uh, about the size of the HAZOP team, how, how are you going to decide the team size of the HAZOP? Yeah, so typically when we do a HAZOP, um, everybody wants to come, which is not ideal. Ideally, your team size should be kept to a minimum. Around six people is a good number. 
um, but you can do it up to 12. If you have many more than 12, you're going to start getting uh, potentially people who are not participating. This can be dangerous because other people in the team assume that they're not saying anything because they are listening and they understand what's going on when actually they're busy doing their emails. And so then this person thinks, well, that thing that I thought of is not important because so-and-so is listening and he doesn't think it's important. So really keeping your team as small as possible. Sometimes when there's a lot of peop people working together, for example, you have the, the client, you have the engineering contactor, you have the vendor, you're going to get a large team, but just make sure they all know they have to participate. Um, and that comes down to the facilitator, making sure everybody's uh, talking in the session and contributing. Okay, um, if there's anybody you wanna ask a question directly, please raise your hand. I will uh, have the mic open, I believe. Uh, anybody have a question? Okay, Ramesh, she has a question there. If you wanna open the mic, Samir, for Ramesh, then I have uh, Vijli next. Go, go ahead there, Ramesh, uh, Mike, Mike uh, Samir, please. Uh, Ramesh, you need to unmute yourself, please. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we go can ahead. You now. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it possible to have an effective HAZOP uh, done remotely? Uh, because I'm asking with respect to the COVID situation existing in many countries, and uh, the most of the projects have been uh, stuck up at this stage wherein the HAZOP cannot be done uh, because of this COVID situation. And the client also doesn't want uh, the HAZOP to be done remotely since they feel that uh, it will not be effective. Uh, what is your opinion? Can we have an effective uh, uh, HAZOP uh, done remotely? Yeah, so Ramesh, that's a great question. Um, I have done, I think, eight HAZOPs remotely, some of them up to three days HAZOPs. What I would say is that if you're doing a HAZOP remotely, you need a really experienced facilitator. You cannot have a beginner doing this because you need to know the people who are going to participate at different times during the HAZOP so that you can call them out. You need to set really clear ground rules for the HAZOP to make sure that everybody is actually participating. And what I do is I will ask random people questions all the time to make sure they're listening to me. And if they're not listening, I will start asking them more questions to make sure they're definitely listening to me um, and they're not asleep. Um, and then the other thing is you need a little bit more preparation time. So when I do online HAZOPs, I make sure that I have a really good look through the PNIDs. And I just, I have my own brainstorm to think about what could go wrong on this facility. I don't put that into the room, but at the end of each node, I have a quick look through my list to make sure that we have covered everything because we're in this sort of remote situation. Remote um, workshops won't work with teams where the people are less experienced. For example, if, no, if, the, if the whole team has never been on a HAZOP, I wouldn't recommend you doing it remotely. But if you do have to do it remotely, make sure you use the video. And as I said, the facilitator being really experienced is key. I also used um, my, I scribed myself rather than having uh, someone scribe for me because I found that that was a better use of time. It made it more efficient. So yes, there are a lot of companies doing remote HAZOPing, but you just need to make sure you have a few extra things in place to make sure it's a good HAZOP. These things are things you normally put in for a normal HAZOP anyway, but um, just make sure that you have a really good facilitator helping you there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, next, I think, Veji, Veji, if I pronounce her name right. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for arranging this great session. Uh, and uh, my questions were sent in advance, actually. Uh, my questions are related to how to mark the PNIDs. Can you please give some key advices or some rule of thumbs to prepare the notes? And the second question will be, when we do the 
risk ranking we list out the safeguards in most of the cases in in hands of training we were told that safeguards are not taken into account while assigning the likelihood but i couldn't see any supporting literature or any standard or any document to substantiate that statement can you please throw some light on this thank you okay well well i'll take the first one the hazop node definition if you, there's an ICME course uh, for HAZOP leaders, which I facilitated, and they give you a lot of information about how to node. But some quick tips are making sure if there's a difference in the pressure boundary, for example, if you're going from a 600 pound line to a 300 pound line, that's a good place to break. Normally, I would always finish on a valve. So I don't like finishing on a flange. So I always finish a system on a valve because that's what's actually going to happen in the system. Making sure that when you draw your nodes, that one node flows into another. There's no sections of pipe that are left um, uncolored, if you like. And um, also, sometimes if you have a very big complicated vessel, I'll split it into the gas flow and then the liquid flow. Um, and then if there's two types of liquids, you've know, got the oils and then the, the waters, I will split it again. But it really depends on the experience of the team. If you have an inexperienced team, smaller nodes is better. If you have quite an experienced team, you can have a larger node. Um, and always make the, the first node a little bit small, if you can, so that people can get into the swing of things. The second question with regards to risk ranking. The industry standard says that risk ranking can or cannot happen during your HAZOP. It's not a requirement. Um, for myself, I always do the risk ranking for consequences only. And the reason for this is because in the HAZOP, we can have a lot of discussions about, oh, I saw this happen. No, I've never seen this happen. Oh, no, that's crazy. That can never happen. Those are pointless discussions in the HAZOP. What I want to know is what are the consequences if this goes wrong? And those consequences need to be without safeguards. Why is that? Well, I need to know. How, how reliable I need to make my safeguard, right? So if you tell me that if I touch the electric switch in my house, I'm not going to get electrocuted. I say, okay, right, really? And you say, yeah. Well, then you say, well, why is that? And say, oh, well, because as soon as there's such a high draw, the, the shutoff valve in um, the fuse box will happen. And say, okay, but we need to consider without consequences. So the consequences of me touching my electric is certain death because I will be electrocuted. But my safeguard is emergency shutoff trip in the, in the fuse box. And that trip needs to have a certain integrity. So we can think about how many times is Louise going to put her finger in the socket or her child. And then we can say, okay, based on that, this is how many times this switch might need to happen. It has a failure rate of X. But if I don't know the consequences, I cannot put the right safeguards in place. If, you, if I tell you no chance of being electrocuted, you come to cost savings and you say, oh, that switch on the switchboard is really expensive. I think we could cut it out. There's no severe consequences associated with having it because we haven't listed it anywhere in the HAZOP. Then you can see how a safeguard, which is actually key and what you assumed in your HAZOP, you can see how that could then easily be removed in your project if you don't list it as a safeguard for the consequences, which are the actual consequences without the safeguard. I hope that helped. Okay. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Um, now I have a lot of questions to be, to be honest, uh, Louise, which is a show that we have very, very interested the audience here. And they are looking for some, uh, some uh, help. And uh, we would like to share with you later uh, how, how we're going to help you making this more better. And uh, uh, we have some, some news that we're going to share by end of this uh, webinar. Uh, but let us uh, go for the, some written uh, question here about uh, uh, so about the application uh, for HAZOP. Uh, uh, is the HAZOP applicable for engineering industry too? I mean, uh, is this something related to engineering industry? I don't know what it exactly means, uh, if you can understand the question. Yeah, so HAZOP, I would say HAZOP is a systematic analysis 
of a system, right? So if, for example, you are going for a process system, which is the typical system you apply it to, you will apply guide words such as pressure, temperature, flow, um, and level, right? But if you wanted to apply this technique, because it's systematic, you're thinking about it. If you wanted to apply it, for example, to a um, conveyor belt, right? And th things are coming along the conveyor, which is maybe a different industry. You could say, well, what if there was more things coming than what we had? What if there were less things coming? So that's the same methodology as used in the HAZOP. And it just gives you a systematic way of thinking through the consequences. The main thing is, is your facilitator is an experienced facilitator and they can choose. You, you don't have to have the standard guide words if they don't apply to your system. So I've done HAZOPs on, uh, for example, we did HAZOP on um, a, a well which was coming back with sour gas. I didn't really go with the regular guide words. I used different guide words because we were worried about a specific risk, right? But having a, an experienced facilitator will allow them to identify those different guide words which may be more applicable to your system. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will open the floor for uh, one of the audience question here. I think Ash Ashuk, you have raised your hand, so you are in the first line there. The next I will have to talk to Mohammed, Mohammed Darwish, he has uh, raised his hand too. So uh, Ashuk, if I pronounce your name right, uh, you have the mic. Yes, Ashok. Ashok, that's good. Can I? Hello, can okay. you hear me? We yeah, can hear go, you, yeah, yes. we hear you, yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I have just one question, uh, which I have put in the question and answer box also. I would read that for you. Is it compulsory to close out a HAZOP action? Or can the design engineer technically prove that it is not possible to act upon the recommendation? Why this question? Because sometimes in a HAZOP, a lower level engineer, process engineer comes to attend. And then when the recommendations go for close out to the senior, senior engineer, he will explain to him that, oh, oh, it does not happen like this, but it happens like this. And hence it need not be closed. Is that an acceptable solution? So Ashok, what I'm gonna say is, it is compulsory to respond to all recommendations. Now, when you respond to that recommendation, it doesn't mean you do what they asked you to do, right? So as I said, I, we raised the recommendation, we thought it was really clear. The engineer thought, well, that doesn't happen, so no, it's closed. No, really understanding what the intent is. So what was it that the, the HAZOP team identified that worried them to make them raise this recommendation. So for example, in your situation, uh, maybe they identified a potential for liquid overfill of the system. And the young process engineer thought that the overfill was going to happen from one uh, level, but actually it's gonna happen in another place. And the other place doesn't result in the hazard, right? The response to the action map, he might have said, I'll oh, make sure you route such and such to a safe place. Yeah. The response so can... to the recommendation may be, hey, look, that it, it's not going to overfill there. It's going to overfill here. This is already rooted to a safe place. So we do not need to do that. But make sure you respond so that you, you respond to the hazard. So you, you know that it's mitigated, if you see what I mean, Ashok. Yeah, so we should have a correct technical justification for not closing the action as suggested by the hazard. Is my and yeah, and correct? it needs to be yes, and it needs to be documented. So yes, don't just course. leave it as an open documented. If you have the correct technical um, justification and it meet, and it mitigates the hazard or eliminates, then yes, there's no problem. Sometimes we're only a team; we can make mistakes and we misunderstand what's going on. Okay, thanks a lot, Luis. No worries. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have other question here. It's uh, coming about uh, how do you avoid dispute in scope of constructual scope of uh, work when it's come evolving action and closing action when doing a HAZOP as a design contractors. So some sort of dispute around the scope, constructual scope and what this has to do with the uh, HAZOP. Okay, well, what I would say is that this is, um, so when you're setting up your contract for your project, you need to be thinking about the HAZOP when you set up the contract. 
and make sure you word that um, the contract in such a way that either, I mean, if you're a fee contractor, maybe the right thing to do is to hand over all the actions to the, the next stage of contract, right? But if you're the contractor who is then going to start up the facility and you do a HAZOP just before startup, the right thing is not to not close those actions. So have a clear plan about when the actions are going to be closed out by which contractor and build this into your contract. If you haven't done that, which sometimes happens, you may need a variation on the contract. And then also being really clear. So if you have a really good facilitator, they will only raise recommendations where it addresses a hazard. If it addresses a hazard, you want to close that recommendation both as an engineering contractor as well as a client. You don't want to build a facility which is going to blow up imminently on you, right? You don't want to build a facility where someone will lose their life in the first five years, right? That's not what we want to do. But the dispute normally happens when you have a strong participant or a weak facilitator and recommendations are raised which are not specifically linked to a hazard or a cause. That's when you start to get these disputes because it's seen as preferential engineering. So another way of doing that is prioritizing the recommendations with the facilitator. So doing priority one and priority two, those are ones that are actually linked to a hazard. Um, and then priority three are, can be seen as the preferential engineering. And those ones could be optional for closure. Okay, so that's another way of structuring them, but you just have to be really careful when you put that in and make sure that the facilitator who was involved in the workshop is there so they can clearly articulate, yeah, no, that one's linked to that. No, that one was just this or what, you know, so that you don't um, lose some of your recommendations. The main thing is in your preparation for your HAZOP, make sure you do your checklists and then build it into your contract, who's going to close which HAZOP action. Um, and then um, having a strong facilitator to, to pull it together towards a hazard rather than just uh, raising ad hoc uh, recommendations. Okay, thank you, thank you, appreciate. Uh, I have one, um, I will have two questions then we will, uh, we will end up uh, close the session. Uh, about uh, Mohammed, he will be next. Uh, I just have one written question here. Um, do you think a human error is a guide word? So I don't take human error as a guide word because all of my causes in the HAZOP are generally related to human error. For example, I mean, there could be some instrument error going along, but for example, valve X is closed when it should be open. Now, if you have a good facilitator and a good structure, you go through each valve doesn't matter whether you think it's not possible to close that valve, you consider the consequences associated with each valve in that process, say this valve is closed. Well, if it's a manual valve, the only way that that valve can be closed is a human error, right? If it's an actuated valve, there's different ways it can be closed. It can be closed either human error or it could be closed because of an instrument error. There are some things which maybe are not considered in the HAZOP and it might be considered in sort of a layout review or a design review after the HAZOP. For example, if you have two level gauges on a system or two level gauges close to each other, one's reading on this tank, one's reading on this tank, and you need to read tank A and not tank B, there could be an error because if the gauges are next to each other, the person could read the wrong gauge. Those sort of things are considered in what is called a layout review with human factors. Almost all of your causes in your HAZOP will be related with human factors anyway. So there's no need to have an independent um, guide word, but I include things like startup, shutdown and maintenance to catch anything that we haven't caught before. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have Mohammed. he's uh, raising his hand for some time now. Uh, Mohammed, if you would like to uh, take the mic. You need to unmute yourself, Mohammed. Mohammed, uh, we still cannot hear you because you're still uh, muted. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, if you can kindly. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Mahmoud, okay. Mahmoud, okay. Mahmoud, okay. We can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Good evening. 
Okay, thank you very much. Really, I would like to express my gratitude and uh, appreciation for this with Saudi Arabia. Actually, the manufacturer that produced uh, iron bar. And when we made that study, we depend on some criteria, and the most hazard was coming from Sometimes they melt the, uh, the iron, and when the water comes to that area to melt it, metal, uh, there was uh, explosion reaction. So the, that uh, manufacturer may uh, request to make uh, hazard study. But the benefit actually, Ms. Louise uh, answered my it was seven criteria to, to use them as a basic for making the hazard study, which are the flow, temperature, pressure, and level, corrode, and uh, observe. But what uh, Ms. Louise now answered me, she said that what, what if you are carrying out? So this criteria, I think, will be changed. Uh, I'd like to get an uh, answer for this. Yeah. And the criteria of HAZOB study, it's not fixed. No, so um, typically the HAZOB study is structured around a process, so flow. So in your case, um, wh when you're milling the iron, what you might have considered is more dust, right? I, I think that's probably what's caused your explosion is you had too much dust. You may have considered um, ignition um, as a, a potential hazard is probably what you would have done is you would have done a hazard first, a hazard identification study, and then followed this on with a, a um, hazard. And you would have considered things like more grinding. What if there was more dust? What if there was less dust? What if there was less grinding? What if there was less taking away and it was building up? Those sort of things would have come out of your hazard. And then things like potential ignition sources would have come out of something called a hazard, a hazard identification study. Um, so you probably would have done both of them and we could have combined them into one study depending on how complicated your process is. But yeah, probably would have used different ones for your process. It's really, so if you consider a normal like oil and gas process, what's actually happening is things are flowing, right? That's why we use flow as our main guide word. With yours, you may um, use a different guide word, for example, if you're milling. So you might say more milling, less milling. If there's a thing about how big the particle size is, you might say have a guide word particle size, bigger, smaller, you know, middle. Yeah, if there's a quantity of finished or not, those are the sort of guide words that you would have and then apply the deviations more, less, other than, does that help, Mohammed? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it was clear. Okay, uh, I have one last question. I will have it to Mr. Tayyib. Tayyib is uh, he's raising his hand for some time. If you would like to take the mic. Uh, Tayyib, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes. So, hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. We can okay. Hear you. So, so firstly, I would like to thank you for this uh, webinar. Free webinar, really, it's uh, amazing. I, I'm sorry, I catch up only in the in the last uh, minute. So, I'm sorry for that. I was driving. So, I just I have question. I'm working right now in Qatar. In it is a petrochemical plant. So, during uh, has obsession, it is uh, in operation phase. The has facilitator he tell us about one recommendation and I am I am a little bit confused about it. He started with some condition that you need to consider uh, the design. There is no issues in the design. And starting from this point, we will search out the causes and the deviation. So we need to consider the design. There is no problem in the design. I have a bit confusion whether he's right in his uh, thinking or no. And what is the idea behind, you need to consider there is no problem in the design, please. Uh, 
And uh, again, thank you very much for for the webinar. Okay, so what, what he's trying to say here is when we do a HAZOP study, we need to start from a basis. So for example, we are processing um, some fluids at 90 degrees C. We have a pipe work and it is said that the pipe can is designed for 120 degrees C, right? That is our basis for doing our HAZOP study. So when I consider more temperature, I'm gonna say, well, can I get more than 90? So that's the first question is, if I can get more than 90, fine. What is the hazard associated with that? Is it an operability issue, is it not? Then I say, okay, well, can I get more than 120, which is my design limit? And that's what he means here is, you can't assume that because if you've specified that the pipework is rated for 120, don't assume that someone bought marshmallows instead of steel and then made the pipe and therefore it will melt immediately. No, you need to assume that the, the pipe is what you said you were going to buy and that is what you've installed. Now, if you're doing it on an operating facility, what you need to make sure that you bring in, sometimes under a lessons learned or current condition um, for the system, is things that have gone wrong. So for example, I've bought this 90 degree pipe, great, but actually I needed to coat it with something that was only rated for 40 degrees. And so now I'm having a lot of problems because this coating is deteriorating all the time. Well, yeah, so we know there's a problem with the design there and that might be one of our recommendations. Say, hey, actually guys, you're operating at 90, this, this coating's only designed for 40, so this is why you have the problem. Yeah, but you only bring in problems that you, that you know are problems. You don't assume everything is broken. Does, does that make sense, Tayyip? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you need to consider only the problem when the, for example, the piping is in the work, for example, over, over, uh, over pressure, for example, over operating, something like that. And then we will not tackle the design itself. We will not consider, as you tell, uh, this is not stainless steel pipe or this is not li like this, something like that. But, but my, my question is, so there is a recommendation to the design itself. So what is now the dilemma here. So once you will complete the the, 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 the hazard, there is something to the design itself. For example, you need to send some message to the operation manager or something, or there is some problem in the design. You need to change something. You need to make something. So I guess there is a design issue here as well, no? Yes, that's right. So when you raise recommendations, you may raise recommendations which require an engineering change. Now, what the facilitator needs to do is they need to be able to understand whether that, that engineering change means, no way, you cannot continue to operate today. You are going to have an incident immediately if you do not shut down, or whether it's something that you could um, maybe make a temporary, uh, the temporary measures. For example, uh, we had a facility where the, when there was a gas detection, the uh, power generation didn't shut down automatically because it was an old facility. So instead of it shutting down automatically, we had a procedure where a person went out and pushed the button. Now, obviously, if there is a big black gas cloud, that is a risk for the person. And the other way that we were managing it is everybody just evacuated. It didn't matter how big it was, everybody just evacuated. So if we were unable to isolate the ignition source and it did ignite, uh, at least there was no people, it would be asset damage. But um, what we did is we had a parallel project, which was to automate the shutdown. And that was going ahead. But in the meantime, while we were doing that, we needed this measure. Now, the HAZOP facilitator won't be able to make that decision for you, but they should be able to identify those scenarios which are really important. And they must be highlighted at the end of each day to the um, person in charge of your facility and say, hey, look, You've got this um, hazard, it's completely unmitigated, and this is the recommendation we've raised. You need to decide how quickly you're going to close this and whether you can continue to operate with this in place. Um, and then that allows the operations team to, to um, analyze that at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, to conclude our session today, I appreciate your time and effort, uh, Luis, for uh, joining us today and give you the, the knowledge and experience you have done for all, 
a long time in the industry and share such uh, experiences are great for everybody. It's people already experienced with the people who are already starting this journey. And one thing that we would like to announce uh, today is that uh, Louisa, even though she was busy and she's doing a lot of projects uh, right now, she agreed with the Notify Academy to share some uh, uh, tricks and tips on, on HAZAB and more details. Uh, and we have a series of uh, workshops that's going to be uh, aligned for almost two months. Uh, that's one is going to come the first on the, on the series of uh, workshop number one about what is HAZAB. Uh, this is going to happen on September 22nd. This is like a four hour course. Uh, it's going to just cost about $97. Usually this kind of course, it costs around $400. Uh, this is a, a discounted rate for Notify users. If you would like to join us on uh, September 22nd, there will be a, a what, a, a what is a HAZOP course. And there's a, another nine uh, courses that will follow. We will announce it uh, uh, based on the, um, the needs and the preference of our users uh, because we have this, uh, but we don't, we'd like to share it with you later and see what is gonna fit your schedule and who's gonna uh, see the best time. So maybe, uh, Luis, if you wanna give us uh, what is gonna happen with these sessions and maybe the first one gonna come on 22nd, what is HAZAP? What's there in the four hours? What's going to be able to learn in these four hours? What's what's your uh, take on this? Yeah, so what is HAZAP is actually, so what we've discussed today is just some really high level. If you don't know what a HAZAP is, some of the information we've relayed today, you, you may not really understand what we're talking about. What we're going to cover in this session is really what is HAZAP? What does it look like? What preparation do you do? Um, what is a session? What does good recording look like? What is the difference between full and um, partial? And I'll show examples of how this works. Um, I'll show examples of how it didn't work so well um, in the industry. And then we'll go through at the end, a very short sort of session, just to show you how it might work on a very simplified um, process. Okay, so uh, one thing we would like really to, to tell you about this course is very exclusive. It's gonna happen one time. And uh, we would like to see most of these people who are looking for such a knowledge. I see a lot of question came uh, that tell me people they need some help on uh, building a HAZAP knowledge. This is gonna be a great uh, opportunity for you. Uh, what about the remaining one? I, I, I have a list here and I, we, we talk about it and we are scheduling some of it, but we say, let us put it in hold until we see how, how these guys gonna, gonna see the timeline because we know it's the end of the year, it's maybe not fit everybody's schedule. We say, uh, so let us go through this one by one, just tell us what this about. We have the second session will be, uh, what is the big deal about HAZAP incident investigation in perspective? What is about, what is about session number two course here? Yeah, so this course is, if you're not actually going to be doing a HAZAP yourself, but maybe you are the person who, um, is managing the asset and you just need to know a little bit about, well, why is a HAZOP a big deal? Why must we do a HAZOP at different stages? This is what's gonna be in this session. It's really high level for sort of managers and it's gonna give you a perspective of what your, um, potentially your exposure is as an asset manager that's financial as well as potentially um, legislative exposure is if you don't do a HAZOP and you don't follow up on it. And we'll be giving some examples of where things have gone wrong um, and also some examples from the Marsh report, bringing sort of the financial element in as to what can go wrong as a result of not doing a good HAZOP. Uh, the second one is the two uh, session three, four, five. Actually, it's a, it's a discipline uh, uh, oriented kind of uh, a workshop. Uh, so this session number three for process engineer, what is my rule in the process in the HAZOP? The second one, instrument engineer, what is my rule? Scrabs, what is my rule in HAZOP? Uh, and the budget holder, the same thing. So we have uh, four type of people. We are targeting them in uh, different sessions. Uh, what is about these sessions, uh, if you would like to add? Yeah, so um, what I've found when people come to HAZOP sessions, especially uh, so process engineers generally know what they need to do, but what I've found when I'm preparing for a HAZOP is that they don't actually realize how much information I need so that I can do the HAZOP effectively, right? So this is what this session is about. 
what do the process engineers need to do to prepare the session so that I can do my job effectively as a facilitator? And if they're not getting asked those questions, well, you know, they need to be asking why, why is the facilitator not interested in these? And some of the things that they need to bring with in their little toolbox when they come to the session. So I'm going to ask them questions from the heat and material balance. No, I don't need a copy of the heat and material balance, but the process engineer needs to come with the most updated heat and material balance to the session. So it's going to be those type of things. Which documents do they need to prepare and give to the facilitator? How long in advance do they need them? What kind of questions they might be asked in the HAZOP and what things they need to be prepared to answer in the HAZOP. The same goes for instrument engineers. Sometimes instrument engineers come, they don't know what, what use are they? This is a, this like a process thing, right? Why am I here, right? So just explaining to them what things they need to prepare before the HAZOP, what knowledge they need to bring with to the HAZOP. And that helps you identify the right person to send to the HAZOP. Scribes often are thrown in the deep end. So we're just doing a really short session here, quite affordable. If you're going into a HAZOP and this is the first time for scribing, watch this session, right? Being a scribe, is, it's almost the most important role next to the facilitator. And um, a lot of scribes are scribing. They've never been to a HAZOP before, so they don't even know what HAZOP is. And then they're having to listen, understand, write it down. So this is just really breaking the ice, helping scribes know what they are going to do before they start. And if you are maybe a budget holder or someone's organizing, Send your scribes on this so that they can perform better in your sessions and you can make sure you get a good outcome from it. For budget holders, yeah. we're really just going into a little bit about um, what is their role? How can they make sure a good HAZOP happens? So, for example, some of the things about what questions to ask, where to push. Sorry, Farouk, you were going to say? Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'm listening. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the next one is, so we're going on to the, in the final series, how to effectively manage HAZOP action or recommendation closure. So um, I have a lot of experience from a lot of different facilities closing HAZOP actions um, from drilling to Iraq, to Norway, to the North Sea. Um, so I can share some of my experience here and what worked really well for me and, and what didn't. And so that it can make it better for you, for you guys, for your facilities. And then knowing when to HAZOP is important. If you HAZOP too early, you're gonna to raise too many recommendations. If you HAZOP too late, there's no potential to modify your design. So I'll give you some tips about when to HAZOP and then the different types of HAZOP that you will see um, at different times. So then we conclude the session seven about uh, how to effectively manage a HAZOP recommendation closer, which is I think one of the most problematic issues seen in, in many incidents. Uh, what do you wanna to add to this one? Yeah, so as I said, that one is really helping you learn from my experience on closing actions in a lot of different environments. Okay. Um, and it also um, maybe thinking about, so I've seen there's a question about vendors. So again, how do you manage that sort of interface with vendors? There's some things about contracts in there, et cetera. So that, that will be covered in that one about closing recommendations. And I, I think sessions eight, you already answered the question yeah. when the HAZOP, you would like to make sure the HAZOP is came to the right point. And session nine, you talk about uh, identify the competence of the HAZOP facilitator before you hire them. This is something yeah. very important you mentioned. And yeah, so I just want to give you some tips about how to make sure you hire the right person before you hand over the paycheck, right? Yeah, this is something we see a lot of time happening. We didn't get the right people as a facilitator. Uh, last gonna be, I think the, 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 the project, I will say. <laughs> this is where people really gonna see the actual things happen with the multidisciplinary team. There are gonna be multiple people. I think you're gonna have more than um, two or three people gonna join this uh, last session here, session number 10. Yeah, so what I want to do in this last session, and we, we can hold it in uh, one of two ways. It depends on how people want to do it. We can either have a very small session with maybe 20 people and each person gets a role in the HAZOP and I give you a background and then you come in and you participate and I can show you how you should be participating or we can run it as an example, which is what I've proposed, where I get some people that I know in different disciplines to attend and we HAZOP a system in front of you so that you can see what a good HAZOP will look like 
and I will facilitate the HAZOP and scribe so that you can see what it will look like having um, facilitating a HAZOP. Okay, thank you, thank you, Luis. Uh, appreciate your explanation. As we mentioned to you guys, uh, this is a, a series of workshops going to be starting on the 22nd. Uh, the remaining, we will announce it as it go. Uh, the first one going to be September 22nd, uh, almost the same time of the workshop of the webinar. Uh, unfortunately, we get a lot of questions, Luis. We we have very limited time, and we exceed what is being designed for this uh, um, webinar. Uh, but we may promise you to uh, answer this individually and we would like to uh, get uh, Louise help in this one. But at the end of the day, I uh, really appreciate all the uh, participation. We have very active uh, audience today. Uh, we got more what we think we can uh, have in terms of questions and uh, we would like to promise you with another series will follow. Uh, uh, that's the end of it. Uh, if you would like to add something, Samir, I'm not sure if you would like to add or Luis. Yeah, and uh, Farooq, uh, those who have uh, uh, got questions and which could not be answered by Luis because of time constraints, they can head back to Notified uh, and, uh, you know, from the app itself, they can go ahead and ask the question to Luis directly and they can communicate with her in real time. So that, that should help. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending and for the really good questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Luis. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. See you.